welcome to sunshine for your life. You know, I do a lot of traveling, especially from this city down to the coast and back. I travel all over the state, but I have done a lot of traveling anyway. And on one of my trips, I needed to go, I was going to the coast and I needed to stop at a post office that was about halfway between here and where I was going. And it was right off the highway. So I knew I'd be there at about eight o'clock when the post office opened and all I wanted to do was take an already stamped letter and put it in the mail slot and come back to my car. And it was going to be real set quick, you know, 30 seconds or so. So I drove into the parking lot of the post office and I drove very close to where the door was. And I remember having a conversation with myself and saying, should I lock the car? I was the only car there. And I said, nah, what can possibly happen? I took my keys. I didn't think anything could happen. I took my keys and I took my letter and I walked into the post office, dropped the letter in the mail slot, and then came out. And by the time I came out, I was horrified because someone had parked very, very close to my car and a well-dressed elderly lady was had her hand on my doorknob, ready to open my car door and steal the purse which I had left on the first uh, in the front seat. And I thought I shouldn't have I should have locked it, but you know there was nobody around. Well, I think that some people hang around and wait and see who comes in and see if they can steal. I mean, she might have been stealing for a gang or she might have been a drug addict. But all I had to do was to just take that letter and put it in the slot and come back. It couldn't have been more than half a minute. So when I saw uh, her at, the, at my car, I rushed toward the car and I yelled out, excuse me, and she absolutely froze and didn't move a muscle. And I went to her and I said, may I help you? And I figured she's elderly, maybe she got confused between my car and hers. And she said to me in a kind of sarcastic tone, she says, the post office is open, you can go in. She obviously didn't want me there because she wanted to take what I had in my car. And so I said, you know, I just came from there. I know it's open. I just came from there. And by the way, this is my car. And then she looked around and she made a charge for her car, practically running to get into her car. And she drove out as fast as she possibly could. Now, I did not... Uh, I did not get a, 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 a you know license plate number. I didn't report her because she didn't take anything. And I was just so surprised. I was just so shocked that somebody would steal when I'd been the only car there. Now it's true that if you do not steal and you don't participate in that kind of an immoral lifestyle, when it happens to you, you're kind of in shock. You can't believe it happened. I could not believe that this woman who was elderly but very well dressed and had a late model car and really looked good would actually steal from me. So I'm kind of standing there arguing with myself and saying, this didn't happen. Oh, yes, it did. Well, she was just confused. She was elderly. No, she wanted to steal from you, and that's exactly what she wanted to do. But I had a hard time wrapping my head around it because, I mean, someone could hand me a million dollars, and if it wasn't mine, I wouldn't take it. And so I, it was just a, a, an odd thing. But had she been successful in taking my purse, which was right on the front seat of the car, and that's what she wanted, uh, if you, I, she would have gotten my license, checks, a debit card, money, a cell phone, and worst of all, all my medication, because I had to carry it with me wherever I went. So that would have been disastrous, and I wouldn't have had any way to call anybody for help because she would have had my cell phone too. So it taught me a valuable lesson. When you ask the question, what could possibly go wrong, then you know something could possibly go wrong, and you need to lock your car, even if it's only for three seconds. So I do that now, but I didn't then. So I praise God that my belongings were protected and she did not get anything. And also, I know that I needed to forgive her because the whole Christian uh, relationship with God is predicated on the fact that you forgive those who hurt you, that Jesus forgave us, we forgive others. So I had to forgive her. And I realized, too, that people, you can't trust what they're like by what they look like. 
You know, the outside of the book, the outside cover of the book doesn't tell you anything about what's on the inside and what's being written about. And so you have to realize that if, if you're not, if you're dealing with people who don't have a good moral system, and most people do, but there are a lot of people that don't, then you just have to realize that they're not going to act like moral people if they don't have the Christian morals that you have. And if they're not Christian, they're not going to care whether something's taken from you or not. If they want to steal, then it doesn't bother them the fact that they stole. If they have what they want, then they just drive off with it and leave with it, and that's it. So this is the way some people are. Now, I know there are a lot of good people in the world, and I, I'm very glad for that. They help a lot of people. But there are others who have no morals at all, and they want to take what you have, and they'll steal to do it, and it doesn't bother them to do so. Now, I don't hate her, and I'm not angry, and I hope she gets the help that she needs, whether it's a drug habit that she has that she needs help with, or if she's stealing for a gang, that happens too. I have no idea. I have no idea of her history or what her problems were or why she was doing it. But I would like to see her again. I don't think that'll ever happen, but who knows? I'd like to talk with her again and because I, know, I have a clear picture in my mind of what she looked like. And I'd like to ask her, what were you thinking at the time? What did you think you'd accomplish? What was the real purpose of your trying to steal from me? And let her know that she's a valuable human being in God's eyes and she doesn't have to live her life like that. There are better ways. If she becomes a Christian and she has her salvation, she wouldn't want to do that anyway. I would like to see her again, but as I said, I don't really think that'll ever happen. But who knows what can happen? Stranger things than that have happened. So sometimes things happen to us and we don't understand why and we can't predict. Whenever something happens to me, I say, is there any way I could have predicted it? If this, was there any way that I could have prepared in advance for it? For most of us, no. Things happen and we don't predict it and we can't predict it and there's no reason why we should even try to predict what's going to happen to us. We may have some kind of an idea of what's down the road for us if we have knowledge of what's coming up, but most of us don't have knowledge of what's coming up. And what the rest, what, what we are uh, stunned with is things that happen that are really outside our realm of perception, outside of what we would have ever expected. Some of those things are good and some of those things are not. There's no real way that we can prepare for what's to happen to us that is unusual. Well, some things, sometimes things do happen that we can't predict. And uh, we have to rely upon God's leadership, upon God's guidance, upon God's knowledge to lead us step by step by step. And it's safe to do so because when Jesus was on earth, he did what his father wanted him to do. As a matter of fact, in John, this is not on the screen, in John 10.30, he said that he and his father were one. You know, we have a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all equal, all one God, different characters, same God. It's like one times one times one equals one, if you want to think of, that, of it that way. So I want to read to you a, a group of scriptures. Some will be on the screen and some won't in terms of um, knowing how to follow God. And if you follow God, you don't get into the predicament that this woman did. I imagine if she was stealing from me, she was stealing from a lot of other people too. God was gracious and she couldn't succeed in what she was trying to do with me, but she may have been successful in stealing from other people. And I would imagine, this is just what I think, now I'd have no proof of this, but maybe she parked her car in a place that people wouldn't notice it. And when cars drove up, she drove up right behind them as soon as they were in the post office to see if their doors were unlocked to steal from them. This might have been the way that she earned money, maybe for a drug habit. Who knows? I don't know. But let me read some scriptures. This first one will be on the screen, and it's John 14, 6. I'm reading it from the NIV version, and this is what it says. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I'm going to read that again. 
I am the way and the truth and the life. <clears throat> Excuse me. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, all through the scripture, the Bible says that there's one and only Savior, only one, and that's Jesus, the Son of God. And if you look in the Old Testament, it says the same thing as it says in the New Testament. The Old Testament and the New Testament are really united together. All of them, all of the verses proclaiming that Jesus is the only Lord and Savior that there is. Now, this won't be on the screen, and I'm just kind of talking off the, off the top of my head, but in a Isaiah, Isaiah was an evangelical prophet, and in his works, if you read his works, especially if you read like in chapter 43, and I think it's verse 11, he says something like, uh, and like, uh, there was no God before me, and after me there's no other God. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. So he prefaces, God always existed, God always will exist, and then concluding with the fact that I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. And these verses in John say the same thing. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So in order to reach the Father, in order to reach God, you have to do it through Jesus, his Son. It is the only way. He is the only way. Now another verse, and this will be on the screen, and this is John 14, 12 and I'm reading it from the NIV version and it says this anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing he will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father let me read that again anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing he will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father God has good works that he wants us to do, and he calls these great things. Now, what are these great things? Well, leading people to the Lord is one of them. And you know that God heals, and you know that God is a provider, and you know God gives us wisdom. All of the things that people need, he gives. And so these are the things that you need to know. I did a funeral for a man uh, just a short while ago. I hadn't seen him for over 25 years. He was a doctor, I had him as a doctor. And then he retired and moved to Florida. And then I moved in this area. And so I never saw him again, never talked with him again. But he, I was a patient of his for a long time. And uh, we worked together and he was very open to everything. And we talked about a lot of things. When it came to the point where he was dying and he knew he was dying, he came back to the state and he told his family that he wanted me to do his funeral. Now, he hadn't seen me in 25 years, and I hadn't seen him. We hadn't kept in touch. I was a patient. He was my doctor. But I had a lot of respect for him, and he had a lot of respect for me, and we talked about professional things, but I had no idea he would even remember me after all those years. But every time they told him, well, what about this person to do the funeral? She, he just insisted I had to be the one. So they were able to get in touch with me uh, through another person who knew where I was. Otherwise, I'm not sure they could have reached me. And I did agree to do the funeral. And when he found out that I had agreed to do the funeral and I was actually going to be there, he went downhill fast. And they asked him, would he like to talk with me? And he said, that would be nice. He would like to talk to me once again. But by that time, uh, he was failing so rapidly that he was asleep for 23 hours a day, and I wouldn't have been able to have talked to him anyway. I did the funeral. It was very successful. And one of the things that I did in the funeral that you don't usually see, but I've started doing it with the funerals that I do, is how to heal from grief. God is the healer, but there are things you can do to help yourself heal from grief. And so I included that as part of the funeral. God arranges everything everything. The Bible says you will do good works, which he has foreordained for you to do. He plans all of your good works. And then when you do those good works, God helps you with it. He is in charge of your life. And if I had a chance to talk with the woman who tried to steal from me, I would try to lead her in the right direction. So, um, it, and I'm going to read another verse, John 14, 23, which is not going to be on the screen. It says, if anyone loves me, he will 
obey my teaching. My father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. And I do want to read that again. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Now, that agrees with all of the other scriptures that talk about the fact that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit resides with us. Everything in the Bible is going to match up with everything else in the Bible. Sometimes we don't think so, but if you take a look at it, the Old Testament, the New Testament, various verses all over the Bible, they are all going to be agreeing with what they are trying to teach and what the Holy Spirit is trying to teach through the scriptures. And so you can't miss it. If you read the Bible from top to bottom, if you read it from Genesis through Revelation, or even if you just read the New Testament, you will come out with the knowledge of the fact that God is God. There is no other God. There is one Savior. That Savior is Jesus. There's no other person that can ever be the Savior. And, and in John, it's, it's confirming that. It's saying, we will make our home with you. We will actually come in and make our home with you. We are like a branch that's attached to a vine. Now, in John, and this won't be on the screen either, but John 15, 4 through 5 says, Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. The work that we do as we are attached to him, he gives us the wisdom and the knowledge and the empowerment to do the work that he wants us to do. And, uh, it, it, and it also continues and says, I am the vine. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you're not a part of him, you can't do Christian work because you can only do Christian work as you are attached to him. Now, here's another verse that I'm going to read. It's not on the screen. It's John 14, 20. You'll notice that a lot of these verses are coming from the book of John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John are the first four books of the New Testament. And a lot of people, when they start reading the Bible, start with John. It's very clear who Jesus is, what he did, what he wants to do, and you get a good picture of, of Christianity just by reading that one book in the New Testament. John 14, 20 says, I am in my Father, and you are in me. I am in you. And just I'll read that again. I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. In other words, that closeness, the fact that he is with us and he is in us. In John 15, 16, and also not on the screen, it says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. No, that is maybe. We do have that, to put that on the screen. John 15, 16, I made a mistake there. We do have that to put on the screen. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. Now, the verse is actually a little longer, so I'm going to read the whole thing, including what's on the screen, and I'll read the rest of it. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye should ask of the Father, he, in my name, he may give it you. So it is a little longer than that. But what it basically is saying is this, you have been chosen, you know, you have been ordained to do certain work and you have been chosen to do certain work. And what it's saying is you didn't choose me, but I chose you. And I ordained you to do that work, or I chose you to do that work, that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it you. And what's the purpose to produce fruit? Now, I'm going to read a quote. This is not a scripture verse. It's not on the screen, and I unfortunately don't know who wrote it because I wished I could give him credit. It's a very good quote, and it really explains a little bit about what the Christian life is like. It says this, to be attached to Jesus Christ as the branch is attached to the vine is a natural way to live. 
There is no effort to it. The branch doesn't try to hang on when the storms come. It belongs. Its life is not something it has to work out for itself. It is a part of the vine. It doesn't have to struggle to produce and do great things for the vine. It just has to be. Its relationship will take care of the fruit bearing. It has a relationship that is right, natural, and easy. And that's kind of our relationship with God, if you stop to think of it. If you are attached to God, you're like the branch that's attached to the vine or the branch that's attached to the tree. You belong to the tree. The power that the tree has is in you. The life that the tree has is in you. And so for you're not just falling off and doing things on your own. You're attached to the, to the tree. So the tree is there empowering you and giving you the juices and whatever you need to do to, to produce uh, flowers or whatever it is that you need to do. So the relationship is is there. You don't have to fight for a relationship. It's there. And I always tell people, you don't have to force God to be your savior. He already is. All you have to do is accept what he has done for you and, and have that attachment to him. And he will work in you and he will be with you and he will take care of you and he will lead you and show you the way and show you what you were supposed to do. It is a natural relationship and it is a natural relationship. Our relationship to God is what causes us to abide, and it allows us to do God's work. Psalm 139, this is not on the screen, says that God planned our days before one of them came to be. God knew all about us before one of our days came to be. And C.S. Lewis, who is a great Christian writer, said this, the more we let God take us over, the more truly ourselves we become. So you let God take you over, you let God work with you, and you truly become yourself in the process. God has given each one of us things to do, and we want to complete those things. And it means that we can complete those things because he is in us, empowering us to do so. And that, in turn, becomes our legacy. So I'm going to close it here. We, we will be doing something else next time. Please join me then.